Hi. <laughs> this is a didgeridoo, uh, also known as uh, Yidaki in the Yolongu uh, language, which is one of the native languages of the Northern Australian people, which also happens to be the place of origin for uh, the didgeridoo. It's believed to be the oldest instrument on the face of this earth. Researchers say that this is an easy of 40,000 year old instrument. Uh, perhaps the oldest documented instrument ever. It's also believed that if earth would have a sound of its own, it would be the sound of a didgeridoo. And the reason perhaps lies in the way this instrument is born. The most natural birth of the instrument is when the core of the eucalyptus tree is eaten out and hollowed out by the ants and termites. So that when the earth passes through, it produces the drone. So what exactly is a didgeridoo, you would ask? It's essentially just a hollow piece of pipe, really. Uh, there is a new world order and an old world order, uh, you know, kind of divided now because of the materials that are used. The old world says that it's still made in wood. The new world says that we can probably make it in plastics and PVC and a couple of other uh, slides. But the basic design still remains the same. You know, um, so how do you play is what you would ask me, right? What, what was I doing with the mouth? You've all seen Three Idiots, right? You know, there's one scene when the Professor Virus asked Raju Rastogi, So, Mr. Raju Rastogi, please tell us how this in induction motor starts. And Raju Rastogi says, Brum, brum, brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Chinese piece will effectively resonate stress. Uh, yeah. So while that was happening, uh, I was into music. I was going out and attending a lot of you know, open air concerts. In one of such concerts, I kind of uh, you know, saw somebody playing a ghatam. I was like, dude, this is like really cool instrument, I amazing sound, let's you know, probably go to the market and buy myself a matka. <laughs> and so, so such life is, you know, but being an industrial in, uh, production engineer, I had an access to the mechanical engineering lab. So I went back to the workshop, I picked up some sandpapers, I started to tune it, you know, I went, I sanded the matka, you know, inside out, I was like, so it's, it obviously it did not become the instrument, it did not, really develop any musical capabilities, but then started to sound a little better. So much so that I actually went out and I performed my first commercial concert while studying in campus, and I was paid 500 rupees for that. So that was like, voila. <laughs> oh, you bet, totally. So while I was experimenting with a makeshift ghatam, I was you know, researching about what this whole instrument is about, learning about South Indian classical concerts. Uh, there's one particular concert that kind of moved the needle. By the way, the reason why I'm saying so uh, is because the era that I'm talking about is the one wherein there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there was no mobile phone. You had to actually go and meet people, ask questions to them. Finding information was extremely old school. So you had to actually go ask them the relevant questions rather than asking them to Siri. You know, it's, it's easy today that you hey, hey Siri, uh, you know, what's a didgeridoo? And Siri probably, you know, just pops up the answers. But back then it was very, very difficult. So in one of those concerts, the, the, it kind of moved the needle for me. Wherein I met Mr. Ghatam Karthik, who's sitting in the center there. He, he plays Ghatam. He's one of the disciples of Mr. Viku Vinayakram. Uh, and I, after the concert, I went back to him. I spoke to him about, you know, hey, I'm from IIT. You know, like, oh, hey, um, hey, Macha, wanna come? Like, say, I want a ghatam. I'm like, oh, cool, really? So, and he was like, he extremely kind to, you know, offer me to come down to Chennai and buy myself a ghatam. In the similar concert, I saw another person who doing something with his mouth. And I thought perhaps it's beatboxing, but that's not beatboxing he was doing. It was something very, very different that he was doing. I asked him, like, dude, what are you doing? And he showed me this. <laughs> That, ladies and gentlemen, is a Jaws harp. Uh, so I went down to Chennai, bought myself a ghatam and a morchang, came back. Remember, there was no internet. Uh, the basic emails were working. I tried to figure out a way to play a Jaws harp. I could not. One fine day, I kind of wrote an email to Ghatam Karthik, saying, that, sir, I could not, you know, I could not figure out. So he sent back to me an, a text email tutorial saying that, you know, you got to hold it in your mouth and you know, do something with it. I tried doing it after 72 hours and uh, chipped teeth. I, uh, you know, I was able to play it. Needless to say, my dad wasn't too happy about the chipped tooth as well. Yeah, that's another story about it. So this is how it sounds. So that's a Jaws harp. Jaws harp essentially is a lamellophone with the Latin root uh, lingua which basically means tongue attached to an end. It's one, again, one of the oldest instruments on the face of this earth. You've perhaps seen it across. There's been a Chinese painting from fourth century BC, wherein a painter is painted playing a morchang uh, or a jaws harp. Uh, you've perhaps heard it across the entire time, but never realized it was a jaws harp. You've seen Tom and Jerry? Yeah. When the Tom jumps on his tail? When in the old movies you had to do the uh, horse moving, that's always been jaws harp right in your face. So how do you play a jaws harp? And that's also the way, the, the reason why it has come to known as a jaws harp. The commonly this instrument has started to be known as Jews harp, but trust me, there is no connection to Jewish or Judaism. Uh, it's just because of the slangs that people like kind of cool. This thing, it becomes juice. So, yeah. so how you play this is when you place your teeth on this brass frame and not biting, just placing it here and pulling the trigger. 
And you move your tongue in and out, which kind of gives those psychedelic trans feels and you know stuff. So I have a, a, a video which kind of you know gives you the range in the overtones that an instrument can probably produce. I'll just go over this video. That's the, the range of psychedelic instrument. Uh, Jaws harp has many names. It has over 900 names across different parts of the world. In South of India, it's known as uh, Mursing. In Russia, it's known as Varghan. In Siberia, it's known as Komuk. In Nepal, it's known as Morchunga. The one that I'm holding in my, ma in my hand is uh, Morchang from Rajasthan. Uh, it's made by the last few remaining families uh, in Jaisalmer today who are making these instruments, the blacksmiths. Their forefathers used to be in the weaponry, uh, the cavalry uh, of uh, Maharana Pratap. Uh, when Mughals attacked Maharana Pratap and they defeated Ma the, the, you know, Maharana Pratap, they decided that they'll probably abandon city life and they'll lead a life of a nomad. And since then, they've been on their own making instruments, making uh, artifacts of iron, selling it, and then living a life of a nomad. It's only about, for the last about 40 years that they have settled themselves in Jaisalmer and making a living out of making various instruments and obviously uh, the, the otherwise utils, uh, utensils in iron. A jaws harp otherwise can be made in several uh, other uh, materials. You know, this one is in brass. I have couple of others in iron. It can be even used in plastic and credit cards for that matter, if, uh, you know, if nothing else works. You know? The reason why this instrument is so important is because it's considered to be the father of a harmonic or harmonium. Because of the way the sound is produced and the principle, principle remains the same. That's the same principle in which a harmonic or harmonium is actually also played. So it's funny, uh, while researching about a jaws harp and trying to understand where the whole piece is, I came across a gogona, which is a bamboo brother of a jaws harp from the Assam. <laughs> A gogona is played in Bihu, which is also the festival of harvest. So while I was researching about Jaws Harp and then I landed on to Gogona and I was learning about Bihu festival, etc, etc. And I was searching for Gogona images all, all the way across. And I was like, why is this Google images kind of showing me a woman, you know, dancing? And I couldn't figure out why. And then I saw Gogona as a hairpin. It's amazing how, how various cultures kind of reuse the same material, the leftovers from perhaps the other artifacts so they may be using bamboo for, and they use it to use it as a, you know, a hairpin and then use the same thing as an instrument as well. And while I was doing that, another instrument kind of caught my eyes, which is uh, Pepa. So Pepa essentially is a hornpipe made from the uh, horn of a buffalo or a yak. Uh, it's very royal, very, very royal in the whole sound feel of it. It won't even perhaps need the mic. It's amazing how when you're researching and learning about one particular instrument, something else completely, you know, jumps into your face. And it fascinates you so much that you go deep dive into that culture. And the whole, uh, you know, information soaking experience is so overwhelming and humbling at the same time. And you realize that you don't even know the iota of what's happening. You know, you just don't know. I mean, the, the, the fabric of life is amazing. It connects one dot to the other. 
and this reveals the oblivious at times when you don't even realize what it's actually throwing up at you. And it's only, it, it's actually taken me over 15 years to realize what IIT has actually done to me. And I come to think of it. So while I was researching about all of these instruments, and now thanks to internet, I have access to a lot of this information. I'm researching and learning about so many other instruments. Two instruments which kind of stood out to me, uh, which is what I have here, um, is a sakuhachi and a Native American flute. A sakuhachi is a end blown Japanese flute. This was originated in China, brought into Japan somewhere around 6th century. However, got the limelight in the Edo period, which lasted from 1600s to 1800s. A shakuhachi is largely played by the Zen monks, who were also samurais. And as the legend is to be believed, they were spies in disguise. So they would move around and uh, you know just playing sakuhachi and because they were also adapt at martial arts so if there was a particular uh, threat that came to them they could perhaps use the same sakuhachi as a weapon it also lies in the design how a sakuhachi is made so a standard sakuhachi is 1.8 feet long in the key of d having seven nodes of the root and a stamp of the sun the root ends are chopped to give it a sharp edge. So if there's something, you can actually just ward it off. So it's Saku Hachi. You know, fast forward a few centuries uh, and civilizations and cultures from, if you skip how the flute was originally born and you come from, you know, when and the flutes were made out of animal bones to now fairly more sustainable material in wooden, plastic and a couple of other things. Um, on one side, when you have Sakuhachi in the east, th separated by thousands of kilometers in the west people, the Red Indians were making flutes made out of uh, the cedar wood. It's beautiful to realize that a Chinese Zhao flute, the Japanese Shakuhachi and Native American flute, are all in minor pentatonic scales, separated by thousands of civilizations. So many, so many, so much cultural diversities. I mean, Native Americans are different than Japan, right? I mean, it's a no-brainer. Japan is so different from China, yet the flutes are so similar. Traditionally, flutes were single chamber flutes, you know, as you would expect. The Indian Basuri again is a simple single the straight single chamber. However, the Native American drone flute, Native American flute is a double chambered, which kind of gives it a characteristic echo sound. I'll probably give you a small demo of that. The legend of uh, this Native American flute kind of goes back that this one guy was trying to woo the girl who was apparently one of the princess and she was not looking at him at all. So after trying for a couple of years together, he was sitting in one of the forests and there was a woodpecker who was trying to beat into the wood and one wood fell down. He picked it up and decided to play that. So this girl listened to that sound and came to him and that's how she fell in love with the music first and then the guy. So that's the melancholic reaper, if you, uh, if you remember the, the, the poem, is somehow derived out of that particular piece. Then came the Native American drone flute. So this is the Rajasthani counterpart of Algoza, if you've heard. Also the bean is again the same similar principle. So you have a drone which has, uh, this particular one is in minor pentatonic scale. Again the pentatonic scales. Uh, it's beautiful that you have one Native American flute all the way in the southern America and the cultures are very different. Same instrument, you bring it down to India, take it to the mountains and Himalayas. 
and it just transcends into something else. The same melancholic thing, and let's try something else. about these instruments is they're all extremely rare ancient instruments so even though in today's age I was we have access to the internet I haven't found any maker of these instruments in India they're extremely handful of people very few people who actually know about these instruments so and not much has changed to these instruments the shakuhachi is still the same or Native American flute is the same these these instruments are so advanced in the very basic structure of it that not much has changed so we had the flutes and then you had those keys and then you became the clarinet and then you know it, it kind of changes the whole plethora of those instruments but these instruments still remain so uh, what, what do I say so so concrete and so just to the music that even the new age genres of music have not been able to touch it in fact if you overlay these instruments on top of the new age electronica it just brings it back to the glory. I have a small video to again uh, demonstrate the power which probably is the last thing I would want to share. Thank you.